so. You gotta turn. You gotta really be. Oh wow! It, it won't turn off now. That's all. It won't turn off. That's <laughs> bad. <laughs> I can use the stick. Go away, son of. So do it. Anyway, all right. So what was the very? All right, everybody, with your computers open. Unless you're doing something incredibly important, monumentally fundamental research. Just get up on the table and put your finger. What are you doing, Jake? He's solving mass Nobel problem. Prize research. You're solving a mass gap problem? All of them. What are you doing, Eustace? <laughs> Closing your computer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Good. Thank you for your attention. Um, all right. So, uh, I just realized what's weird. I never have my glasses on when I lecture. I can see things. It's strange. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so we left off at the end of last lecture. Oh, this is awkward. Um, we left off at the very end of our last lecture with uh, a promising glimpse that even though C and P separately were sort of maximally violated in the weak interactions, it seemed to be the case that the combination of C and P together, at least for the decay of the pion, seem to be a good symmetry, okay? Because uh, if we do a P transformation, it turns a left-handed neutrino into a right-handed neutrino, which doesn't exist. But if we follow that with a C transformation, then that turns the right-handed neutrino into a right-handed anti-neutrino, which is something that exists, okay? However, I left you with a teaser that, in fact, in the standard model, CP itself is violated. However, the violation is much smaller than the violation of C and P separately. Those are what we call maximally violated. So what we want to start talking about today is uh, where is CP violated in the standard model? What does it look like? How do you determine that it's violated? And there's actually an, an incredibly important theoretical component to the standard model, well not a theoretical component, but there was a theoretically motivated prediction um, that preceded observation that came out of a requirement to explain this CP violation. So, so uh, and hopefully we'll get to talk about that. So we're gonna talk about CP violation. And it turns out that in order to, uh, to see where CP violation arises, uh, we're going to have to go back and talk about this particle, the kaon. Um, now, the kaon, and we're going to focus on the neutral kaon, is a combination of a down and anti-strange quark. So again, it's a, it's a meson, and so it's composed of two quarks, happen to be the down and the anti-strange. And what I want to do, and unfortunately, to explain CP violation, I'm going to have to draw some diagrams, some Feynman diagrams, and I'm going to try and interpret what's going on in the diagram, but you know, I, I realize that we haven't actually systematically studied these things yet, but I think you might be able to follow um, what I'm saying. If I uh, start with a little kaon that is happily propagating along, then what I might imagine is drawing two lines, one for each of the quarks that the kaon is made up of, and so I might have a line moving like so, indicating that that's a down quark. And then, and, then, and I can go ahead and give you some, some previews of what we're going to find when we start working with Feynman diagrams. Uh, whenever I draw a Feynman diagram, I have in mind that time flows to the right. So when you think about what's happening, you should think about you start on the left and you end at a later time on the right. And then, as suggested when we were exploring the existence of antimatter in the Dirac equation, one way to functionally think about antimatter is that it is just matter moving backwards in time. So the way we indicate that, and it turns out to be uh, useful calculationally as well, is to just reverse the arrow for antiparticles. So I call this a strange, but because the arrow is reversed, I understand it to be an anti-strange. Notice, I would not do this because that would be an anti-strange moving backwards in time, which is in fact a strange moving forward in time. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna uh, double negate our effort here. So I call that a strange quark, have the error go backwards in time, therefore it's indicating an anti-strange. Now, what is interesting is that this happy little kaon can, for lack of a better phrase, play with itself. 
um, by emitting a W minus And in the process of emitting a W minus, this is a weak interaction, the down quark actually changes into an up quark. Okay, clearly the charge of the down and an up quark are shifted by a factor of minus, or by a additive minus one. And I, actually you guys have the sheet. So remember these sheets that I handed out last time, does everybody have it? This is something you should be bringing to class because we're gonna register the lab. Did anybody not get one? You didn't get one? Were you not class last night? Yeah, I just did Okay, so if you flip that over, look at the, or actually, it might, yeah, if you flip it over and look at the list of mesons, uh, K0, there it sits, fourth L in the pseudoscalar mesons category, you see it's a down anti strange. And then if you go back to the front and look at the quark charges, you'll notice that the charge of the down quark is minus a third. And the charge of the up quark is plus two thirds. And so if I take a minus a third charge and I, re, and I uh, remove from that a negative one, or you can think of uh, adding one to this, then you end up with the charge of the up quark. So in all of these little Feynman diagrams I'm drawing, the total charge is conserved. Okay, charge isn't being created or destroyed, it's being conserved. And then of course you have the strange quark with a minus one third charge. When it absorbs the W minus, okay, the strange quark can transform into an up quark. Okay, again, a plus uh, charge. No, anti up, sorry. Got yeah, anti up. And this should be a charge plus one third. Okay, this is a charge plus one third because it's an anti strange anti particle, so it has the opposite electric charge. Um, and so now we've got an up quark and an anti up quark floating along, but those can too do interesting things with each other. And by exchanging yet again a W minus, so this is a weak interaction, this can convert to an anti down and this convert to a strange. Okay? So we kind of we kind of reverse the thing that we did in the first place. We turn an anti-strange into an up and then to a down, but the down into an up into a strange. Okay? And the significance of this result is that a strange anti-down is the, is the quark constituent of the anti-K0. Okay. Okay, so um, what we have is a particle that strangely can, without any external influence, so this is happening purely internally, this particle is shifting into its antiparticle. All right? Now, that's a strange thing. Normally, if we want to turn a particle into its antiparticle, then we have to have some interaction with an external influence. Okay, we could have an electron and an anti-electron uh, uh, with the external stimulus of some photon. But this is just this nice little uh, bound system, and everything that's happening is happening internal to the bound system. We're not in, we're not receiving anything from ex from outside of the system. But it is important. It is very important to note that unlike the photon, the K0 is not its own antiparticle. Okay? I mean, you can see that by the quark constituency. All right? So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore the implications of this, and this story is, it's a tiny bit complicated, but it's, it's not terrible, but it is, of course, essential for seeing CP violation. So, um, we sort of see the C part of the story here. We've got charge conjugation would turn this into this, turning particles into antiparticles, but we need to also roll in the P part of the story. So for the P part of the story, what kind of, under parity, what kind of particle is the K0? Look on your sheet. 
what word on that sheet is important for distinguishing the type of pseudoscalar? It's a pseudoscalar. So if I do a parity transformation on a K0, what do I get? Say it again. You get a negative sign. Okay. So if I do a parity transformation on K0, I get that minus K0. Um, of course, if I do a charge conjugation operation on K0, I get K0 bar. Okay. And then if I combine them, I get minus K0 bar. Now, if I do a parity transformation on K0 bar, what must I get? Why? It's also a pseudoscalar meson, but if I did not tell you that it was a pseudoscalar meson and I told you this, how could you determine that it would also have a minus? Well, we said that G0 is equal to G0 bar. So, does anybody remember our discussion about the eigenvalues of parity for bosons versus fermions? Fermions are the same. Fermion, if I have a fermion, its particle and antiparticle have different have different signs of parity, intrinsic parity, whereas if I have a if I have a boson, the the intrinsic parity is the same for both the particle and, and, and the antiparticle. Okay. Of course, we have that. So if I combine CP on the anti K0, then I get minus K0. So now, if you look at this, is K0 or K0 bar an eigenstate of CP? Yeah, what does it mean to be an eigenstate? The transformation on it, that is equal to a constant times the thing. Yeah, so if you have a, so, so where up here have I written an eigenvalue equation? Parity. Yeah, parity. This is an eigenvalue equation because you do something to something and you get back just a number of times the thing you started with. This is not an eigenvalue equation. This is certainly not an eigenvalue equation, okay? But we can use K0 and K0 bar to construct eigenstates of CP. So if I form something called K1, and K2, which is going to be the sum, just looking at this, you can probably get a hint that this has a decent chance of being an eigenstate of CP, because if I do a CP transformation, it's going to turn this into that and that into that with an overall minus sign. Okay. And similarly here, if I do it here, it reverses the order, but since I'm adding, it doesn't matter. Here, they're subtracted, and if I reverse the order, it gives you an overall minus sign. So it probably doesn't, probably not surprising that the eigenvalue in this case is plus one and minus one, where the plus one comes from the fact that you get an overall minus, but CP itself has an eigenvalue of minus on each of them. Okay. <coughs> now, what I want to do is, um, sorry, I, I haven't reviewed these notes, and so I'm just I'm, I'm going the best I can here. Um, when we combine K0 and K0 bar to form these K1 and K2 states, there's an extra thing we need to talk about, and that is um, when we combine them, so this is two particles that I'm combining into a single bound state, if you will. What orbital and spin angular momentum configurations are we putting them into, and why is that an important part of the story? Why do I need to specify what spin and orbital angular momentum configurations I'm giving these two particles? For the helicity. Say it again? For the helicity. It would impact the helicity, but, but for this story explicitly, what does that change? Or what would it impact? 
So I said that CP on K1 was plus 1 and CP on K2 was minus 1. Does that in any way depend on the orbital and spin angular momentum of the combination of K0 and K0 bar? Yes? Yes. The answer is yes. So this is something that we talked about um, briefly in class last time. Uh, the parity of a combined system is not just the intrinsic parities of the particles it's made up of, but also it gets a contribution from any angular momentum that the, com that the combined system has. Okay. And I, I think I gave you an expression for how the parity changes depending on the spin and the orbital angular momentum quantum numbers. Now here I'm just going to assume the most trivial combination with zero orbital and zero total spin angular momentum, okay? So we're not actually gonna use that, it's just I, I want you to realize that I cannot talk about the parity of a com combined state unless I've specified what angular momentum configuration it's in. <laughs> Just gonna ignore that noise. I hope it goes away. Okay, so hi Peter. This is not Casey giving the talk, um, but it's the second best thing, which is a pretty terrible uh, substitute. <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, now let's let's talk a little bit about how these things decay. So if I take a K1 and I watch what it does, K1 will, will decay typically into two pi ions. And this can happen in two ways. It can either decay into a pi zero plus pi zero, or it can decay into a pi plus plus pi minus. Okay? So the Ks here that we're working with have no net charge. We're not dealing with K plus and K minus. So these are neutral, therefore these combinations are neutral, therefore when this decays, it has to decay into something with no net electric charge, okay? And the K2 decays into three pi ions, and I've got a couple of ways to do that. Right. So why do I say that it can decay into two pi ions or three pi ions? Is there any rule that's telling me why K1 would decay into two pi ions and K2 would decay into three pi ions? The electric charge is conserved in both cases. Yeah, let's actually investigate the, actually the CP eigenvalue of the states that are coming out, okay? So if I consider the, oh Lord, this be interesting. Um, Got your one note going, so I can better watch your notes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look at those in a minute. If we even get to it, at the rate I'm going, I'm, I'm probably not even going to get to the end of the last bit of the lecture. Sorry about that. That's okay, that's okay. We had fun. Um, <laughs> You might, you might uh, quickly put in a help desk oh, to add to the, <laughs> the full filling in the, for the for the next second. Second. Okay, so um, if I, yeah, okay, uh, sure, yes, all right, yeah. Okay, so the pions, what are their uh, eigenvalues and a parity? Look it up. What kind of particles are pions? They're pseudoscalars, so if I do a parity transformation to a pion, what do I pick up? I pick up a negative one, okay? So for these, for, for, the, for this case, my parity eigenvalues are going to be minus one times minus one, and for this case, my parity eigenvalues are minus one times minus one times minus one, okay? What about the charge conjugation operation? If I charge conjugate, a pi zero, what do I get? A pi zero. Pi zero. I get a pi zero. It's its own antiparticle. Okay. Well, that's got an eigenvalue of plus one. If I charge conjugate a pi zero here, 
I get back itself, so that's got an eigenvalue of plus one. What if I charge conjugate pi plus? I get a pi minus. What if I charge conjugate pi minus? I get a pi plus. So a combination of a pi plus and a pi minus is actually an eigenstate of C. Okay. So the charge conjugation eigenvalues, whether I'm dealing with pi zero, pi zero, or pi plus, pi plus, pi minus, are just plus one, plus one. Giving me a total CP eigenvalue of plus one. Okay. However, for the parity situation, again, if I do my charge conjugation, each of these gets conjugated into itself, this gets conjugated into itself, this pair gets conjugated into itself, so I just get three factors of plus one, giving me a net CP eigenvalue of minus one. And so we see that what's controlling K1 decaying into two pi's versus K2 decaying into three pi's is preservation of the CP eigenvalue. The fact that K1 has a CP eigenvalue of plus one means it can only decay into a state with CP eigenvalue plus one. That's a two pi on state. But so it could decay into a four pi on state or a six pi on state? Sure, yes, it could, okay? This is the dominant decay mode, all right? This is, the, this is, gonna, this is gonna dominate the signal, but what's it, you, you can always do more complicated things, but what's important is that this cannot decay into two pi's. Okay, only K1 can. But if it decayed to one pi, for example, well, that would be simpler. So how do we know how many we're decaying into? How do we know? K2 could just decay into a pi on. Yeah. So we need it to be an odd number of pi ons. That's all we need. Um, can K2 decay into... Is the pi zero? Oh, uh, can K2 decay into uh, a, a pion, a single pion? So, so this is, a, this is a, an idea which we're going to start encountering a lot when we actually start talking about decay process, even scattering process, but can you have a K K into, say, a pi zero. Is that kinematically allowed? Well, you should have the same particle with this one. Well, do they have the same mass? Which one is heavier? Yeah, K2 is heavier than pi zero. Okay? So if I'm sitting in the rest frame of the K2, it has its rest mass energy, and then it decays. The pion has to have the same total energy because energy and momentum are conserved. So now the pion has a total energy which is larger than the pion's rest mass energy. So is the pion at rest? No. So let me explain to you what we just claim we're seeing. We see a k on at rest. That's our entire system, and it decays into a moving pion. Are we conserving momentum? No. So, so you can't decay into a single pion. You have to decay into an odd number, and the minimum is three. Okay. But more importantly, you cannot decay into two. Okay. And I, I keep saying more importantly, and you're like, why is that important, Alex? I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Okay. So, um, all right. And I, I told you this was complicated, so um, so you're just going to have to deal with this. So, if we wanted to check. CP, what we could do is we could actually create a bunch of K1s and K2s, all right, and then watch them decay. This is the important claim. If we ever saw a K1 decay into three pi's, or if we ever saw a K2 decay into two pi's, we would have experimental evidence of CP violation, okay? If these two results are all we ever see, and higher order results, results that are consistent with CP conservation, so you know any odd number of pi's here, any even number here, if that's all we ever see in every experimental 
situation, then we have no evidence that CP is violated. But all we need to do is see one event where a K2 decays into an even number of pi's, and we can say, whoop, CP is violated. Yes? Does it have to be, so you said it can be any odd number greater than, greater than or equal to three, but three pions have more mass than Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. You always have to go back and talk about the, whether there's kinematic constraints. You're absolutely right, and, and I'm sorry, I don't, have the, I don't have the pi on mass and the k on mass in my head okay. to compare. You're, so you're totally right. At the end of the day, what is allowed in a process is gonna be dictated by the, there's kinematic constraints. Now, one thing I can tell you is, while that story is always very important for decays, for scattering events, it's rarely a concern because when I scatter two things, okay, I am free to provide them as much energy as I want and there's no rest frame for both of these simultaneously. Because if I go to the rest frame of this, this one's moving. And if I go to the rest frame of this, this one's moving. Okay. So the masses of the incoming particles in a scattering event do not have to be larger than the masses of the particles coming out. Okay which is important because we could never make anything more massive than what we see in nature if that were the case. But for decays, you're exactly right. You have this sort of first rule, first rule of fight club, first rule of decay club, what, you, what, you de what decays has to be more massive than what it decays into. So that's a, that's a good point. Uh, and if I had all these numbers in my head, I might have been able to, to put that together. So thanks for pointing that out. Anyway, okay. So does everybody understand you know, the, the idea of investigating CP violation? We, we cook up a bunch of K1s and K2s, we watch them decay, and we look for an event that shouldn't happen, okay? I wish it were that easy, <coughs> okay, but it's not. Why is, that, why is it not so easy? Well, um, the problem is that when we make K-ons, we actually create kaons using strong interactions, and then they decay by the weak interactions. You might say, what does that mean? Well, generally speaking, it's hard to get things to do stuff with the weak interactions if there's another mechanism available. So if I, have, if I can create a particle and it can happen through a weak interaction process or a strong interaction process or an electromagnetic interaction process for that matter, the, the, the preferred way of it actually happening is through the stronger of the interactions. In this case, it's the strong interaction. So if I slam particles together to create kaons, the strong interaction is the, the force that's really gonna dominate the creation of these things. And what that means is that you're creating them in strong interaction eigenstates. Conversely though, when particles decay, they tend to decay via the weak interaction. Because remember, the weak interaction is the only interaction that actually changes the flavor or identity of particles. It's the only thing that can really mediate decay. So you don't have a competition from the strong interactions when things decay. Okay? So you might say, well, why is that, you know, why is that important? Well, the problem is that, um, why is that a problem? That there's a lot of problems in here, and there's a lot of writing, and I've got to figure out where I wrote it down. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, so the the problem is is that when we create kaons, we create them in these strong interaction eigenstates, not the weak interaction eigenstates, but the strong interaction eigenstates are k zero and k zero bar. Okay, they're the things we actually started off with. So it's K1 and K2 that have these definite CP eigenvalues. It's K1 and K2 we can argue only decay in a certain way, but if I take a collider and I just smash a bunch of stuff together, I'm gonna create K0s and K0 bars, and I can't look at that and say, oh, you know, one of these is a K1, one of them is a K2, because they're sitting there as K0 and K0 bar. So how am I ever even going to dissect that there was a K1 decaying into two pi's or a K3 or a K1 decaying into three pi's or a K2 decaying into three into two pi's to see evidence of CP violation? So what we do is the following. Um, if we make a bunch of K0 and K0 bars, so we have a little collision, say here, we smash some stuff together, 
actually let's do it this way. So if I smash some electrons and anti-electrons together as they do at slack, but the beam energies are asymmetric, then if I create something, generally whatever I create will have a total momentum, okay? And so it won't just sit there at rest or you know be in a center of momentum frame, it'll actually have some net momentum. So in this case, since the momentum coming in from the left was larger, whatever I create will cruise to the right, okay? Now, um, as this thing cruise to, cruises to the right, things are going to decay. Okay. And the question is, how long does it take a given particle to decay? And again, this is something that we're going to talk about when we actually start doing these calculations in detail, but the decay rate is roughly governed by the half-life. Um, or you can actually calculate the decay rate itself and, and look at how that's broken up into different channels, et cetera, et cetera. But there's one very important kinematic consideration that goes into calculating the decay rate, in addition to a lot of dynamic information that we'll learn how to calculate from climbing diagrams, and that is the following. If a particle can decay with a larger mass difference between where you start and where you end, that decay is more probable. Okay, and we'll learn why, maybe at the end of this lecture, but probably not. Okay, so the bottom line is, is these two, K1 and K2, have the same mass, but a combination of two pi ions definitely has less mass than three pi ions. So the decay rate of the K1 should be much larger than the decay rate of the K2. Make sense? Yeah. Do, you, do you want me to motivate that or can you wait? So, so the, the basic idea is the more, the more ways you can decay, the greater the likelihood of the decay. And so what does that have to do with the mass difference? Well, imagine if I had a particle here that had a mass m and it decayed into a, bar, into a particle which was 0.4999m and another particle which was 0.4999m. When this thing decays, these two things are going to have very little extra kinetic energy to spare. Okay? However, if I, um, and this is maybe not the best example, two body decays are too constrained. Actually, let me do a let me do a three body decay. Oh, this is going to be terrible. 0 0.333 m, 0 0.333 m, and 0 0.333 m. Okay. So you've got in those three decay products a tiny amount of extra energy that you can distribute among the k among the decay products. Okay. However, if I take the same process, but this time it decays into 0.1m, 0.1m, and 0.1m, I have a lot of extra energy left over after this decay process to distribute to the particles coming out than I do here. If I give you a larger amount of energy to distribute among three particles, there are more ways you can distribute it than if I give you a smaller amount of energy. So there are more ways, there are more kinematic configurations corresponding to ways of this happening than of this happening. The extreme limit is if this thing decayed into two particles whose masses were exactly the sum of the original particle. There would be exactly one way to do that, and that is the two particles would have to be at rest. So that's kind of the extreme. So the number of ways that you can have a decay happen translates into the probability of that decay actually happening. So the more, the more ways we can do it, the higher the likelihood. So since there's a larger mass difference here than here, this is a more likely process. Now what does that mean for our traveling beam of k -ons? Well, we create them in k0, k0 bars, but there's nothing that stops them from joining up in the k1s and k2s. We just don't really have a good way of knowing if they've done it and when they've done it. But what we can do is we can have these things travel 
down some path, and we can keep looking as they move down that path for the decay products that come out as these kaons decay. They will decay at some time. And what we see is early on, we see two pion decays as well as three pion decays because some of these kaons are decaying via this K2 route and some of them are decaying via the K1 route. Remember, they decay via the weak interaction, so they have to pair up into K1 and K2 before they decay. But what we expect is if we look far enough down the beam line, okay, we should lose one of these two decay channels at some point. Which one will we lose first? I heard about equal numbers of K1 and K2. Who says K1? Who says K2? Does anybody want to support your answer? The thing you just said about the mass difference. Casey, go talk to the guy peeking in the door because I think he might be here about the system. Say it again. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're doing without it now, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that it died on us. And it's not the projector that died, it's that it's not getting a signal from anything up here, whether it's the VGA or the main terminal or the dock cam or anything. Do you want me to wait and look at it? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're just, we're not going to worry about it now, so I'll be done at 12.15, and I think there's a class in here at 12.30, and he might need it, yeah. so okay. if that's enough time for you, or you can come in here and do it now. I mean, if, it's pretty much a quick reboot, if you don't mind if I do it now. Yeah, go for it. Sure. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so... So does anybody want to support their reasoning for which decay mode we should see drop out? Mark? Well, if K1 decays faster, eventually it should be all gone. Yeah, yeah. So, so the K1s decay faster. They're more, there's, this process is more probable. So you can turn that into a shorter lifetime. So the K1s are not going to live as long as the K2s. So if I look far enough down the beam line, Eventually, all I should have are K2s. And so far enough down the beam line, I should only see three pi events. Yeah. So you're saying that K1 decays more often because there are more ways to distribute the energy, right? Yeah. Because there's less mass overall. But since it's a two-body decay, doesn't that constrain how much energy goes into both of them since you have to conserve momentum? Yes. I like that. But does that change our argument? Well, we said that it would decay faster because there are more possible ways to distribute the energy. Oh, oh, never mind. That does change our answer. <laughs> that's, that's, a bad, that's a bad thing. Um, oh. Let me, let me, I, I, have to, I have to go back and work through the details of the energetic favorability. So, and, and, and this might be in the notes that I get to at the end of the lecture, it might not, but right off the top of my head, I see the puzzle you're posing and I know it's, there's a hole in it. <laughs> I just can't see it right now. But it's definitely the case that the larger the mass difference, there's an energetic favorability. Okay, so, and, and you're right, it is, it's so constrained that you don't have any freedom in assigning things, but I'll have to, I'll have to figure out what, what I'm thinking uh, backwards. Like I said, I didn't get to review my notes before I came lecture was Casey was going to talk to me. Um, but I will clear that point up. But for now, let's just 
let's just take it, take it as a given that this is more probable than this, therefore this is going to decay faster than this, therefore after a certain amount of time, all of the K1 combinations would have decayed away and I would only have K2s left. Which means that if I look far enough down the beam line, there should always be a point beyond which I do not see two pi on decays anymore. Yes? Well, decays are a statistical process, so how do we know that it's just, it's not just a K1 that lived a lot longer than expected? Yeah, you, you, yeah, no, but you can, you can do that. It is a statistical process, and, and you can calculate the probability of seeing a K1. And so you can turn that, into by looking at a large number of events, into a percentage. And then the question is, is the percentage of events that you observe, does it match the percentage, percentage that you expect to observe? I agree with you. These are all probabilities, so there's always the possibility that something lives a long time. But what is observed in experiment is that it doesn't matter how far down the line you go, you will still see 2 pi 0 decays. Okay? At a rate larger than you would expect, just given the fact that this is a probabilistic event. Okay? So the actual... That's nice. So someone's moved the projector too, so we'll get that taken care of. <laughs> yeah, but, but, so you just had to reboot the... No, there's a processor in here I had to reboot, uh, which you need me to do that. Okay, all right, all right. No, that's okay, that's okay. Thank you. Um, we will just, uh, hey Casey, you want to come give your talk? <laughs> that's a joke. And next time, why don't you try not to break it? Okay, I'm, I'm turning it off. Oh, I just wonder why it didn't turn off. <laughs> Something's going on. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, the point is, is that if we look down the beam line, Alex, you have a question? I didn't ask it practically, sure. but how do you detect a two pi on decay versus a three? These pi ions are going crazy. How do you pick out those two were from one decay? Oh yeah, yeah. No. So that that's a so that's a that's a good question. So um, and, and the truth is, is that if you like computation and modeling, high energy de uh, detector design is for you. <laughs> because what are you doing? You have, you know, you have this enormous, it's, it's not even a hermetic, there is some signal loss, but it's as hermetic as you can possibly make it. You have this enormous detector system around this thing. And one of the main things that it's doing is when it can, it's detecting charged particle tracks because you can get charged particles to bend and curl in electric and magnetic fields. Um, but truthfully, you're not often even detecting the pions themselves because remember the pions decay. So the pions are decaying into electrons and, and, and anti-electrons along with the corresponding neutrinos. So what you're actually detecting in these processes are really typically tracks of electrons or anti-electrons, and sometimes you have muons that are long-lived enough to get to the detector, and anti-muons. And then you can also, if there happens to be an electromagnetic process, you can put photodetectors in your detector and you pick up photons. So those are the things that we actually directly see from the detector output. And then what you, and, and, and you're picking up the identity of these to some degree, because for example, if it swirls this way in a, in a magnetic field, then you know the sign of its charge. And then uh, using the curvature of the trajectory in the magnetic field with some cross electric field, you can determine the charge to mass ratio, and then that helps you distinguish whether it's an electron versus a muon versus a tau on, not that you're going to see a tau on. And then you know a photon's a photon because it means none of these other things, and it's interacting with the photo detector. But the point is, you figure out all this stuff, and you work backwards and you reconstruct things called jets. So if I have three momentum trajectories that appear to be diverging from a single point, then my assumption is that they came from the decay of a single particle at that point. But this might look like that, which is telling me that these were two pions. 
which came from a sink. So you see what I'm saying? You have to work backwards to reconstruct what was originally happening. You're not detecting any of this directly. You don't have something that says, oh, I just saw two pions, or oh, I just saw two. No, you're seeing all of these low level stuff and working backwards. But yeah, there's an art to it, and they, you know, it works. After, obviously, a lot of, of competition. But it's not even like this is isolated. You've got stuff happening all down the line. And so you're working backwards to reconstruct these things basically by reconstructing these jets. You know, if you've got three momenta that you detect that never converge at a point back, tracking backwards, then they are not coming from the same event. Right? If a particle decays into a bunch of stuff, all of those momentum vectors better come from a single point. So I take it this isn't happening so frequently that it's impossible to distinguish. Well, no, it, it, it is very hard. I mean, you get a mess of stuff, and you've got to weed through all the junk. So there's, you know, there's an art to writing all of the code that sorts through this stuff. And you know, maybe Patrick has done this sort of thing. I don't know. I did it for a year in grad school and decided I was never going to be an experimental particle physicist because it's that bad. But, but yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the, 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 asp, the, the, asp, the, the detection and experiment aspect of experimental particle physics is very heavy in the computational side of, of reconstructing events. It's, it's, a, it's a glorious mess, but it works, okay? Um, okay, so the bottom line is doing our experiment and taking our data and reconstructing things, we only reconstruct two pi on, or, or sorry, we reconstruct both two pi on and three pi on events no matter how far down the beam line we're looking. Okay, so clearly, beyond what we might expect from a statistical fluctuation, um, parity, is, parity is being violated. Okay, now why, why does that imply that parity is being violated? Because because the beam is turning into K2s. The K1s are definitely disappearing. Okay? But the, the thing is, is that the K2s can decay into 2 pi's as well. But with a much smaller likelihood because the amount of CP violation is small. If CP were maximally violated, if CP was as violated as C or P, then this would be a wash because you could say K1 can decay into 3 pi as likely as it can decay into 2 pi. K2 can decay this way or this way with equal likelihood. So there would be no way to distinguish them in the first place. But the point is, is that CP violation is small. Okay, So even though there's a, and this actually happens very rapidly, that the K1s are sort of extinguished from your beam. Okay, that actually happens quite rapidly. And now you've got largely a population of K2s, but there's a small, because CP violation is small, there's a small likelihood that they can actually make use of this channel. And that's this leftover 2 pi events that you see further down the beam line. Yes? So this is the question, how do you construct the K1s and K2s? Because you, you said you make the K0s and the anti-K0s. And then they can only decay via K1 and K2? Yeah. So they, they do that themselves. We, we don't have to tell them to do it. Because remember, a K0 can, can just morph into a K0 bar. So, so this is the way that it happens. And you know, it's just the way that it works. So if I, when I create kaons with the strong interaction, I create states here and here, okay? And then those states, those states are there for an instant, but they are stuck there if I only allow strong interactions because they can't decay. But because there's a weak interaction, the weak interaction mediates the decay, but it does not decay through this and this, it decays through this and this. So this state, this, this superposition state, okay, morphs into this superposition state so that it can decay, which it can freely do because I can start out with a perfectly K0 state and it can freely develop a K0 component if it wants to. What, what does it mean to have a negative K bar zero? 
or positive? It, like the does that is that like direction of propagation? Or? Are you are you talking about when I rotate this? Yeah. So now K two is negative K zero. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm sorry, I probably didn't tilt it right, but I'm trying to reproduce this picture. Well, I mean, even so, what do they mean? What, do they, what does that mean? Well, it's the, the, the negative sign is just a, uh, it, it's not a direction in space. This is state space. It's not space time. Okay. So this is literally, I, oh, okay, so it's like, um, Yeah, I mean, it's like when you do quantum mechanics and you find a, a, a set of, of eigenstates of a, you know, the Hamiltonian of a system, and then an arbitrary state is just a linear combination of those, some superposition state. And you can have negative coefficients in there as well as positive coefficients. Okay. It, it, it's just a, it, it, I mean, you're, you're, you're spanning a Hilbert space with a complete set of orthonormal basis states, these eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and then you're just taking arbitrary linear combinations. And arbitrary means you can use positive or negative coefficients. Does it sound like a fire truck to you guys? Seriously, don't worry. It's the weirdest noise. Okay, so, um, all right, I, I uh, <laughs> okay, so I want to, I want to close. We're clearly not going to talk about calculations today, which really sucks, but, um, but that's the way it goes. I want to close with a couple of significant remarks about CP violations. So like I talked about last time, getting CP violation to, um, to explaining CP violation is actually quite challenging because it's a small effect. Okay, we left off last time by saying if something is very large, if it's a maximal violation, it's kind of easy. You just have some, some conservation law which says that can't happen ever, period or that must happen all the time, period. But explaining small things is actually tricky. The, the smallness of CP actually was, um, it's, it was a very important theoretical puzzle for a long time that was solved with in a, a very sort of triumphant moment in theory. So the, the CP violation puzzle actually predates the discovery that there were three generations of quarks, okay? So when, when the CP violation puzzle was um, encountered and solved, there was no experimental observation of top and bottom quarks. There were only these first two generations of quarks. And a way to get CP violation into the standard model, because right now all of the Lagrangians that we've written down and all of the interactions based on gauge invariants that we've written down they violate C and they violate P, but they don't violate CP, okay? So to get CP into the standard model, uh, a guy, uh, a couple of guys uh, named Kabibo Kobayashi in Moscow, and I can't remember who worked on which part of it, came along and said, well, if I take the, the quarks and I think of strong interaction eigenstates, kind of like what we were talking about here with the K0 and the K0 bar, and weak interaction eigenstates, this K1 and K2, and I think of them as separate bases in the same state of quarks, then there's some rotation from one basis to another, okay? So for example, I can say that if I start out with, a, um, with an up and a charm, strong interaction state, then there's some matrix which gets me there from the upcharge, upcharge, weak interaction state. Okay? I, I choose these two because they're identical except for the fact that one has larger mass. Okay? So they have all of the same properties except for they're different in mass. These two are just different particles. Okay? And it turns out that this matrix right here, depending on whether or not this is the identity or slightly different from the identity, is actually a place where you could potentially have CP violation. After all, we see that there has to be some difference between the strong and the weak interaction eigenstate. Okay? But what's interesting is they figured out very early on that if you have two quark generations like this, then this is a two by two matrix, and any 
transfer, any term you put in this matrix that would give you CP violation, you could actually remove by a unitary transformation. It's just the matrix is not big enough to accommodate CP violation. So what they said was, well, let's just suppose that there was a third generation of ports. Then this matrix would be a three by three. And what they figured out was that in a three by three matrix, you can actually have a CP violation that cannot be removed. It's a true legitimate violation of CP that you would see in the physics. This matrix is called the CKM matrix, the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix. And what's beautiful about it is these guys, these folks, proposed a third generation of quarks just to justify using a three by three matrix to explain CP violation. And of course, we all know how the story ended up because later on, at high enough energies, we discovered that third generation of quarks. Okay? Now, we get CP violation, and you might say, okay, yeah, the standard model is not symmetric. You keep telling us that. You keep saying it's beautiful because it's based on symmetry, and then you turn around and take all the symmetry away from us, and you say, all right, C is violated, P is violated, CP is now violated, but folks, CP violation is actually a very, very important part of the story of how we address the baryon asymmetry of the universe. So very early on in the 60s, when people actually started to try and sort through this problem of why is there so much matter than antimatter, a guy named Sakharov came up with three conditions that have to be satisfied in order to even hope to generate a baryon asymmetry. And those three conditions are that you have to have a baryon number violating process, which we can talk about a little later when we actually talk about what baryon number is. You have to have a departure from thermal equilibrium. And then his third condition was you have to have CP violation. If physics is CP symmetric, you have no hope of explaining why there's more matter than antimatter. You are invariably left to conclude that there's the same amount of matter and antimatter. So it is actually CP violation that is in part responsible for explaining the universe as we observe it. Yes? Um, this question may be irrelevant, I'm not sure. Um, why are there no top quarks in combinations on this entire sheet? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, let, let me actually let me actually leave you with one more quick remark because I totally because I, I want to get done with symmetry so we can talk about calculations next time. Let's 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 revisit that question next time. Let me very very quickly because I know that guy's chomping up the bit to get in here. Let me very very quickly finish our story and we can do this in, in thirty seconds. We had C, we had P, we never talked about T. T is time reversal invariance. That's a hard one to experimentally detect <laughs> because you reverse time and but we can actually indirectly argue that t is violated the reason we can argue that t is violated is because c p t together must be a symmetry of the standard model you might say why is that the case well what's wonderful is remember when we talked about parity as an inversion of all the spatial axes and that that's different than a rotation, right? I said if we do minus one, minus one, minus one, that is not a rotation. An even number of, ro of reflections would be a rotation. Well, if I reverse time as well, then in four dimensions, this is actually a rotation and Lorentz invariance is the four-dimensional equivalent of rotation. So now you might say, what about C? Well, C is just coming along to help us interpret time reversal. Because if we do time reversal, one of the things we know is that we should, our interpretation should reverse the roles of particles and antiparticles. So the bottom line is, you're guaranteed that in a relativistic quantum theory, you have to have CPT be a good symmetry. That means if you violate CP, you must violate T. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. Casey will talk on Thursday if the system holds up. And then we'll do calculations starting next week. Nope, sure no. Are we going to the church or no? Yeah, we can run that. Take me to church.
I'll tell you my sins tonight. I'll show you my sins tonight. First of all, initially you wrote uh, the K not equal to